Hello, you can hear me, very good. All right, let's put it here. Um, well, I've, I've been here, what? I, I can't, I, difficult for me to record. I must have been here two and a half days, two, two and a half days in these sessions, and it's, for me it's been a very extraordinary conference. Um, it's just been a pleasure just to sit and listen and learn so much about Georgia. I have never been in Georgia, I've never been in the Caucasus, though I have spent quite a bit of time in post-Soviet Russia and in actually in the Soviet Union, um, but never came down here. I spent most of my time in the Republic of Komi in a place called Siktivkar, which many of you probably have never even heard of. Um, anyway, um, this has really been a very special event for me. Um, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm stunned to see that at the end of this conference there is still a full room here on a Saturday. Uh, whoa, somebody's been drinking. Um, uh, on a Saturday and it's raining. I mean, I think the temptation will be to stay at home, not to come and listen to um, academic discourses. But anyway, I'm hoping that my talk today will actually um, will actually sort of bring, uh, bring the theory down to ground. That doesn't mean I'm going to avoid theory, far from it, but I want to actually sort of root the theory in some of the stories I've been hearing about Georgia. Um, yes, so, um, so I'd just like to acknowledge um, that this is another reason why it's an extraordinary conference is that this is in two languages and systematically all the way through, which is relatively rare, and as, as a deliberate attempt to, uh, to, 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 let shall we say, diminish the imperialism of English language. Um, uh, and anyway, I, I, I applaud the attempt and, uh, the, and the actual practice of using Georgian um, throughout. And thank you, therefore, for, to the interpreters who've made my existence here possible. Um, you've done a fantastic job. Right, so, well, um, yeah, I've been sitting here for two and a half days and I have learned much and I've, I've been hearing very different perspectives. And as, as, as Nino uh, said, uh, we've had perspectives from the north, financialization from the, ho from the north. Costas came and talked to us um, about uh, very interesting theories about the ways in which actually financialization as a, a model is actually undergoing some sort of crisis. I was not totally convinced it was, but nevertheless, it was a very interesting and important approach, very much influenced, of course, by his own participation and resignation from Syriza in Greece. And then following day, um, we had a talk about the perspectives from the global south um, and coming from India, from Professor Menon. Um, and what I thought listening to this, that um, there's an interesting set of questions as to how to situate Georgia. Um, how should we think about Georgia? Shall we think about it from knowledges uh, produced in the north? Shall we think about Georgia as part of the global north? Shall we think of it as actually part of the global south? Um, should we think about it through the lens of southern, so-called southern theory? Now let me say immediately, I don't believe in these distinctions of north and south. And I think that Professor Menon also was dubious about them. Uh, and also this idea of southern theory is a very, uh, as I will suggest today, uh, is a very... Uh, uh, an ambiguous and problematic idea. Most of the theorists that we deal with, and I'm going to deal with Polanyi and Franz Fanon, um, these are theories that cannot be, in a sense, limited to the South or the North. Um, let me say about myself, I have indeed um, spent time, as Nino says, working in factories, believe it or not, uh, in, in socialist countries, before many of you were born, I worked in factories in Hungary for about on and off for eight years, and then I was in when 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 
When Hungary's socialism collapsed, I decided I was not interested in the transition to capitalism, so I decided to go to the Soviet Union as it was then in 1988-89. And uh, then, actually, in 1991, I managed to get jobs in factories uh, in the, so as it was then the Soviet Union in a rubber plant in Moscow and in a furniture factory in Siktivka. And as so often happened when I work anywhere, the country disintegrates after I've been there. Uh, only it was extremely rapid disintegration in the case of the Soviet Union. Um, well, I, my friends tell me that I should, I, and they told me then that I should not, um, uh, I should not go to any other country, any other socialist country. I shouldn't go to China. Uh, I shouldn't go to, uh, well, as it was then, Nicaragua. I should stay in post-Soviet Russia and I should be expelled to the north and punished for the sins of bringing down these countries. And that indeed is what I did. After 1991, I spent the, the decade of the 90s following the tragic story um, of the decline of the Soviet economy, which I have analyzed uh, through Polanyian in, in a, through a Polanyan vision. Um, in fact, when I did that research, it was really when I first engaged Polanyi in a serious fashion. Um, Polanyi seemed to give me some idea of how to understand what was happening in post-Soviet Russia. Um, uh, you know, at the time, you may remember, or you may not remember actually, there was a debate particularly amongst Western economists as to whether one should make a revolutionary transition from socialism to capitalism or whether one should make an evolutionary transition. The evolutionists were very influenced often by Polanyi who talked about the institutional supports for the transition. And I argued it was neither revolution nor evolution, it was what I called involution and I actually wrote a paper that never got published in English but only in Russian called the Great Involution rather than the Great Transformation which of course was Polanyi's work. That is just by way of introduction and let me say I'm really delighted to be here for another reason is that fact is that so many people well I regard four as so many there may be many more um, are really engaged with the works of Karl Polanyi. In this part of the world, that has been a rather rare experience for me. Karl Polanyi, however, in the West, in the United States, and in Britain, and in Germany, and in Austria, and perhaps even in France, you never know, um, Karl Polanyi is really become a canonical figure in the understanding of capitalism. Um, and uh, so I am really delighted to hear, and actually Nino said that it would be translated she hopes it will be translated into Georgian, which would be really great. So yes, so I was very delighted to hear all these Polanyian um, uh, disquisitions today, and I will continue that. Now, all right, now I'm, I'm trying, I'll help you with my uh, PowerPoint and see if I'm hoping it will help you understand what is going on, but I need my clicker, right. Okay, so methodology, <laughs> okay, um, let's see, I like to walk around, um, I can't think standing still. Um, so, here's a question, is Georgia part of the, this is a question that emerged in the last two and a half days as far as I'm concerned, is Georgia part of the global north, i.e. Europe or the US, or is it part of the global south? Well, we've discussed this in previous days. And first of all, we have to make it very clear that this is often a political or an aspirational uh, question. Um, it's, it's been a, 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 a political issue. So the question is whether, how to analyze it concretely. Is it part of the South or the North? And yesterday I thought we came to the conclusion it's neither part of the South, now south, south nor the North, perhaps it's part of the East, the Global East. The post-Soviet world is actually different. I'm still going to argue, or not argue, I'm going to, the talk will be aimed at trying to actually um, remove that dichotomy north-south 
and use two theorists, Franz Fanon, who you may be less familiar with, and Karl Polanyi, to see which of these two, one theory coming from the south, the other from the north, which of these two theories makes best sense here in Georgia. Hmm. So that's going to be the project here. So obviously I know very little about Georgia, but that never stopped me talking about things, um, countries, um, and uh, I will, and you can of course correct me, um, but I'm drawing on the examples that I've been listening to here and, and, and bits and pieces that I've been reading before I came. All right, so because it's a political question, as I say, we need visions. It's not just, a, you know, I was, I was fascinated on my foot. I, I came on the second day when, when there was this very violent controversy uh, as to the nature of the regime of Gamsakurdia. And uh, so that, that, that discussion was all about, what do the documents say? Well, before you have documents, you have to have theories, in my view. You have to have frameworks, in my view. In the beginning is theory. Without theory, you can't even see the world. We all have theories. So it's not a big, sophisticated idea. We just work with ideas of how the work works. So then we have folk theories, we have analytical theories. And I'm going to be working with two theories of a sort of academic, political character, namely those of Franz Fanon and Polanyi. So, it's going to be a sort of discussion between the two. Franz Fanon is rooted in Africa. I'll tell you a bit more. He was, he was not simply an Africanist. In fact, he came from the Caribbean. He, went, he spent quite a bit of time in France, and then he moved to Algeria. And his books, his book, The Wretched of the Earth, is really a map, a map, a class race map of the post-colonial political economy in Africa. So it's a class race analysis of transition. And then we have Polanyi, rooted in the West to be sure, um, but also subject to multiple influences coming from Hungary and Austria, and then moving to England, and after that to the United States. So he also, it cannot be sort of uh, limited in his perspectives, and actually subsequently would write about Africa. So also interested in the global south. And as we've heard today, repeatedly, I am glad to say, the focus that he had on the commodification, commodification of land, labor, money, and I'm going to add a fourth because uh, uh, yeah. Professor Marina, Marie, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> That's very helpful. Professor Marina was in threes, I like fours. I'm a sociologist, I don't know if you know that, but sociologists in the United States love fours because four is two by two, and you can always make a two by two table. And that's how you make your career out of two by two tables. Beware. All right, anyway, so these are, these are what I call fictitious commodities, and um, they are commodities, entities, factors of production that, if commodified, lose their use value. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then what is very important about Polanyi is the way he links politics and economics. With all due respect to economists, and I hope I don't offend too many here, I mean, economists are often do have these wonderful models of how the economics, economy works, and then it, when it comes to something like social change, they just, it's like a deus ex machina, Bob's your uncle, something comes out of nowhere, and that's democracy or some form of politics. You have to actually be theorizing both politics and economics, and that, of course, I believe is what Polanyi does. All right. So... I'll, 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 I'll just to, to give you a sense of who these characters are, this is Franz Fanon, as you can see, a very serious fellow um, uh, from the Caribbean, and he, tried, he, he lived from 1925 to 61. He died of leukemia, very young, he was 36. Um, born in Martinique, sort of middle class background, went to France, discovered that he was not French but black, uh-huh, 
Yeah, something many people discover in France and other European countries. He then, where he actually studied to be a psychiatrist, he, he then went to Algeria, head of a psychiatric institution, discovered that psychoanalysis, which is what his specialization was, influenced by Lacan, was not going to change the world, and he became, in a sense, a Marxist, you might even say a sociologist, recognizing, as he did in, his, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the institution he worked, he directed, um, he was very much engaged with the violence of colonialism in Algeria um, and sought to actually see how that could be transcended through political organization and became a uh, member of the FLN, the National Liberation Front, um, and was expelled from Algeria and became a representative of the FLN in different West African countries. He wrote The Wretched of the Earth. The Wretched of the Earth is the Bible, or was the Bible, of African revolution, socialist revolution. It was actually adopted, though Fanon had no intention that it should be adopted, but was adopted by many um, of the uh, more radical black civil rights leaders and movements in the United States, the Black Panthers in particular. Um, they adopted his ideas because the wretched of the earth, it is who is going to revolt, it is those who are excluded from production, the peasantry in Algeria, the African Americans in the United States, a form of internal colonialism. So the wretched of the earth is not the working class integrated into a capitalist economy, but those who are excluded that become the revolutionary agent. And he, of course, did an analysis of colonialism, which I will present to you very briefly through an understanding of the relation between race and class. And then we have this fellow with his bow tie, you know, distinguished European intellectual, also very serious, married to a very, uh, uh, a very uh, devoted um, political activist, member actually of the Communist Party, um, uh, so he was always in touch with politics. His work is 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 is, is, is flooded with um, with with political innuendo. Um, he lived much longer, from 1886 to 1964, an extraordinary period to be living. Um, he was born actually in Austria, but spent much of his early life in Hungary, in Budapest, moved to Austria after the Hungarian Revolution, then in 1933 left, uh, left Austria for England, and then um, during the war actually left for the United States, where he wrote The Great Transformation in 1944, a book that has found a whole new lease of life in the last 30 years. The central feature of this book is a critique of the market economy, and the central concept, in my view, is the concept of commodification. And I'll say in a minute a little bit about how that engages with Marx. Now, his book is both historical it is a, an attempt to re-understand capitalism from the end of the 18th century to the middle of the 20th century, largely focused in the, 18th, in the 19th century on England, but then tends to focus more on Europe in the 20th century with the rise of fascism um, and, uh, and forms of social democracy. He was terrified that the market will actually generate and does generate a reaction that is of a fascist character. But he also studies the New Deal in the United States. He has commentary on Stalinism in, in, in the Soviet Union. So he, and he actually talks about colonialism in South Africa. And in every case, in every case, the point is that if you push the market too far, the reaction can be catastrophic. 
doesn't necessarily have to be, but it can be. In all those cases, you find the market generating a reaction of a state regulatory kind, whether we're talking about the New Deal, or whether we're talking about Stalinism, or whether we're talking about Germany and Italy fascism, which is, was his concern. So he's, he has a historical argument, and also he, I believe, has a scale argument. He, really implicitly and sometimes explicitly talks about the lived experience of commodification, particularly of those fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money, the experience of it on the one hand, but also the ways in which that commodification process is generated nationally, but also globally. He's able to move from the lived experience to a global analysis. Very, very rare. All right, so that's the, ah, forgot this gentleman. How could I forget this guy? This guy, um, he was living before these two, and he obviously, not obviously, but definitively influenced both Polanyi and um, Franz Fanon. Yeah, you must have grown up with, some of you must have grown up with this guy everywhere. Anyway, so, but, but what is important is that Fanon is really bringing to Marxist analysis a very deep Marxist account of colonialism and colonial domination, bringing into the account race, hence the importance of much of Fanon's work in not just The Wretched of the Earth, but the other famous book he wrote, Black Skin, White Masks. And Polanyi, as I'll say in a minute, um, he's responding to Marx by moving from production to the market. He is concerned with exchange rather than production, as we will see. And I think to his detriment. Um, all right, so there we go. So I'm going, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a snapshot of Fanon, and I hope it's going to be intelligible. Um, basically, Fanon is the wretched of the earth is describing, characterizing the transition from colonial to post-colonial Africa. And you will see, as I present the picture to you, parallels with this country. But those parallels will be limited. So, well, we start off with the colonizers. And they, as the, on the one hand, the colonial state, which is, in the case of Algeria, the French administrators that go from France and settle, some of them, um, in Algeria, and alongside white settler farmers who have pushed um, Africans, Algerians, off the land. So that's the sort of the colonizers. Um, actually, Fanon does not do much of an analysis of the colonial state. Subsequently, those who worked in his tradition um, have done much better. But the real analysis, whoops, that's not very good. Um, the real analysis is what happens to the colonized. Now here he does something very novel at that time. He does a class analysis of the colonized. So he talks about, on the one hand, the national bourgeoisie, these are Africans, lawyers, civil servants, teachers of a relatively low level, but nevertheless crucial to the functioning of the colonial state, on the one hand, and the labor aristocracy, notice the word labor aristocracy, the working class, a small group, a small class that is actually involved in wage labor, which in the colonial context involves a certain stability that is not available to the other major class, namely the volcanic peasantry. So he distinguishes between the urban bloc, the national bourgeoisie, and the labor aristocracy, and he had all sorts of nasty words to talk about the labor aristocracy as, in a sense, pampered, pampered by colonialism. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, he sort of romanticizes the peasantry as excluded and being pushed off the land, many of them, and they are subject to traditional leaders. I'm not sure 
exactly how to analogize traditional leaders in the Soviet context. But anyway, this is how, this is the African context, a rural and an urban bloc. And this is the volcanic peasantry that are the, is the revolutionary agent. But that revolutionary energy is spontaneous unless it is organized by radical intellectuals, uh, Gramsci would call them organic intellectuals, that have been expelled from the town because they are critical of the national bourgeoisie, then it's, you might say they are, the, in the Gramscian terms, the traditional intellectuals. So radical intellectuals join the peasantry, live with the peasantry, and forge them into a revolutionary class. Yes, and then there is the lump and proletariat caught between town and country, and they are a class that actually can move um, in any direction, easily bribed by one force or another. Okay, that is the map, broadly speaking, that he presents in The Wretched of the Earth. And what is involved here is, on the one hand, what you might call a war of movement, and I'm using, for those who know, Gramsci and vocabulary, but essentially the idea is the idea is to first and foremost to eject the colonizers in a often violent struggle against the colonizers, but at the same time, and this is really crucial, there is you might call a war of position as to where that colony will go after colonialism. And here the question is whether it will be the national bourgeoisie that will be the hegemonic force or whether it be the volcanic intellectuals with the... Oh, volcanic intellectuals. The volcanic peasantry combining with the radical intellectuals. So it's a struggle between two roads into the future. The national bourgeoisie just want to replace the existing colonizers, whereas the peasantry have a much more radical, transformative project, a socialist one. There is Fanon, the romantic optimist, a romantic revolutionary. Now, so to put this very bluntly, Fanon in, Go in Georgia, two roads, that, that, let's first stick with Africa, it's two roads, we got the national bourgeois road, which is a succession in which black take over white. And here the argument is, made by Fanon, that in the beginning there may be a multi-party democracy, but you cannot sustain a multi-party democracy in a peripheral country. You cannot do so because you cannot, for Fanon and for others, that a democracy Electoral democracy, liberal democracy, requires the possibility of redistributing material concessions between classes. And if you're in the periphery, you do not have access to that autocentric accumulation. Democracy cannot survive. And so he says if you take the national bourgeois road, you move from multi-party democracy to one-party state to one-man dictatorship. And the sad reality is, writing in 1961, he was largely, amazingly correct. So, he says, if it's going to be a disaster, the national bourgeois road, therefore we have to take the national liberation struggle to democratic socialism. We have to, but is it possible? And he sort of fudges the issue and he does not really take into account as many people have pointed out the sort of international context he actually believed that Africa would have bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis international capital and he also believed that the erstwhile colonizers would not be interested in deploying violence capitalism and particularly finance capitalism doesn't like violence and therefore, it will be possible for this road to socialism to take place. And indeed, countries made the effort, but in my view, none of them really succeeded. Um, precisely because of these external factors. 
And he's a bit ambiguous as the relationship between these two roads, whether the first, you have first a national bourgeois road and then a national liberation struggle. And of course, this is a big debate in South Africa today, or has been for many years. And uh, the alternative is that, you know, you have to make the choice right at the beginning. If you go, take the national bourgeois road, there's no way of going along the socialist road. All right, well, is this any relevance to Georgia? Well, you have to tell me, but I'm supposed to be talking, so here, national bourgeois road. So yes, well, you know, you have these four regimes, and you know, in many ways, they do look like a national bourgeoisie. And what it would be interesting to do if you, you know, the economists talk about policy, the political sciences, with all due respect, um, the political scientists talk about sometimes about individuals. I mean, what Fanon is suggesting, what Fanon is suggesting is that we have to look at the composition, the class composition of the dominant class and to see what is behind, what fractions of capital are actually um, engaged in these, well, in this case in Georgia, in these, in these four regimes. Yes. But what is so different about the situation in a post-Soviet context is that the bourgeois road, which is a reformist road, which leaves the class structure unchanged in Africa, is a revolutionary road when you're making a transition from Soviet society. And so the neoliberal road that we have been talking about and has been so beautifully uh, deplored, di displayed here in many of the talks, that actually is transformative of this country, but in a capitalist direction. So that is the revolutionary road, very different to the, very, so the, 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 the legacy of the Soviet period makes this a very different situation from Africa. I just want to emphasize that. And then the third point I would like to suggest is that, as, 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 as Fanon does, um, Fanon argues um, that in, when you take the national bourgeois road, there's very likely, along with the development of authoritarianism, there is a development of what he called then new forms of racism. And today we might talk about ethno-racism. And that is also, you might say, a characteristic of the development in these parts of the world. Yeah. Well, we could talk about that to what extent that is the case. But anyway, that's the, nas that's the national bourgeois road. And then we have Georgia, the socialist transition. You can only laugh at me, right? Um, socialist transformation. Well, for Fanon, he does not deal with what are deep ideological limits, the ways in which, of course, socialism in a country like this has been discredited. Then there are economic limits, which I've already said that Fanon didn't sufficiently seriously, which we've had to talk about every minute of this conference, that this is a small country in a capitalist world. What room is there for maneuver? And then also what Fanon didn't deal with adequately are military limits because you're sitting next to a neighbor that um, has all sorts of expansionist ambitions. So the socialist transformation clearly seems to be out of the realm of possibilities. And when Fanon is talking about socialism, he's talking about a democratic participatory socialism that is definitively not a Soviet socialism or state socialism, nor a capitalist road, nor even social democracy. What exactly it is, I don't know, but he speaks, he writes lyrically about it at the end of The Wretched of the Earth. Okay, I will come back to Fanon at the end, but that um, is my attempt to actually use the lens of Fanon, one of the greatest theorists of the post-colonial transition, to show actually the, the gap between what happens in a country like Georgia um, uh, as compared to Africa. So we have to be careful about making the analogy to the global south. 
So, all right, now we talk, go, back, uh, go on to Polanyi. How, many, how much longer have I got? 15 more? Okay. Well, we all know Polanyi, so I can be quick. Aha. So, all right, the great transformation today. All right. Look, why is, fat, why is Polanyi so significant, at least in, in many countries of the West? The ascendancy of the market has been palpable since the 1970s, the recession of the 1970s, and the profitability crisis that came with it. And the profitability crisis generated the market expansion, the neoliberal project. And then we have the Soviet collapse, and uh, so the idea was that so-called socialism can't work, that therefore that's all the more reason why we have to go full-blown towards a market solution. No longer social democracy, no, that is problematic. As we heard today, um, the, I think it was Leila who was talking about the idea that somehow the failure of, 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 of the neoliberal model, according to many, is that it didn't go far enough. And the idea, of course, is that you have to take it to its extreme, whether it's shock therapy um, or it's big bang theory. You have to take the neoliberal model as quickly as possible. It's a revolutionary transition. Um, and that's the only possible future because we're at the end of history, because it's the only possible future for post-Soviet world. Um, so again, one attention is drawn to Polanyi, who tells us of the dangers precisely of that utopian model. And then the 2010s, we have the Great Recession that spreads from the United States to the rest of the world, and we get with it, starting 2011, an enormously broad spectrum of social movements from the Arab Spring to Occupy to Syriza to uh, Podemos to, 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 what am I missing? Must be something I'm missing. Oh, uh, Gezi Park in Turkey. And of course, hmm? Extinction Rebellion, well of course that's just yesterday really. Um, that's almost a, 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 yeah, that's, I'm talking really about 2011, 2012, 2013, and then we get all these more right-wing movements, populist movements, and then we get, indeed, Extinction Rebellion. I'm glad you, that's right. That's, uh, anyway, yeah. an Extinction Rebellion, and if we're going to talk about Extinction Rebellion, we may have to talk about Yellow Vests, we have to talk about Five Star Movement, but anyway, a whole series of movements that can be traced back to, in my view, can be traced back to um, the expansion of the market. All right. So, we are making a shift in our analytical framework from Marx to Polanyi. Marx emphasizes production as a sphere of organized resistance to capitalism. Polanyi says, nonsense. It is the market, is the experience not of production, but of commodification. And instead of talking about exploitation, we should be talking about, Polanyi says, commodification, the experience of it. Instead of class struggle, we talk about counter movements to the market. Yes. Yes. So, that is a big shift. And I would argue that actually Polanyi is coming into his own in these days, in this era. It is indeed the case, as I'll suggest in a minute, that the working class as wage laborers are ever more in a precarious situation, have ever less leverage power, which, whoops, silly, okay, um, have ever less leverage power. Capital is not dependent upon the wage laborers as Marx assumed they were in the 19th century. And instead, it is non-exploitation, but this experience of commodification that becomes 
the grounds of social movements. That is not to say there is no exploitation. There is exploitation, but it's not experienced as such and the grounds of effective working class mobilization, or it becomes ever weaker. So, we have to return from Polanyi back to Marxism. The big thing about Polanyi is that he didn't anticipate another wave of marketization. He thought there was one long wave of marketization from the end of the 18th century to the middle, well, to the beginning of the 20th century that then led to the reaction of which fascism and socialism or social democracy, New Deal, were the responses. He never imagined there would be another round of marketization. And that is a big puzzle. That is because he threw the baby out with the bathwater. He actually, in attacking Marxism for its teleological view of history, he denied the importance of capital accumulation and the ways in which capitalists in the pursuit of profit generate crises which are resolved by the expansion of the market. And I think there are three waves of marketization. There is one wave of marketization in which commodification of labor is the most important in the 19th century. Then the commodification of money at the end of the, at the, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, to which Costas referred to the day before yesterday. And then today we are facing with the driving force, ultimately, of the commodification of nature. And if the commodification of labor had a response that was local, organized around the factory movement, the commodification of money gives rise to state interventions, and the commodification of nature will have to give rise to, as we know, some sort of global organization. If we are to survive. All right, so first wave for Polanyi, the first wave is understood as a conflict between market and society. It is to do with the commodification of land, labor, and money, particularly emphasizes the commodification of labor and the way that generates counter movements, whether it is the development of cooperatives, whether it is the development of Owenism, whether it is the development of um, uh, beginnings of, of labor unions, whether it's the factory movement, um, is it, and note that it's all, written, it's all written about England. So the local counter movement, the second wave, now this is where it gets interesting, now I've changed my mind about this, actually if you read Polanyi, the second wave of this period, he doesn't talk about two waves, but the second period that begins, um, that he, that he, that begins at the, in the turn of the, of the 20th century, the early 20th century, um, that gives rise to fascism, New Deal, Stalinism, um, he formulates that not in terms of market versus society, but capitalism versus democracy. And his argument is, don't forget he's writing in 1844 and his writings in, 18th, in 1944 and his writings in the 1930s are all about capitalism and democracy cannot live together. Either capitalism dominates and we have a form of fascism or democracy dominates and we have a form of socialism. And for him, socialism is not social democracy, but it is a sort of collective self-organization of civil society. Yeah. In which the market is, has very firm limits, but the market does exist. Now, what he missed was the possibility that a liberal democracy, as a sort of concessional or a compromise between capitalism and quote, democracy, a liberal democracy could actually survive and did survive um, in many countries in, in Western Europe. And then we have third wave marketization, and I believe that way to analyze third wave marketization that begins in the 1970s is to recognize both the relationship, the tensionful relationship between capitalism, democracy, and between market and society. Okay, all right. So now I want to, this is wave two. As I said, the tension here is between capitalism and democracy. It either goes to fascism and socialism, and what he me misses is the possibility, the stability of liberal democracy. Now, liberal democracy continues, but in wave three, 
it comes under a legitimation crisis that because under wave three beginning in the 1970s neoliberal capitalism believes in the necessity of polarization between classes and not in concessions because demo liberal democracy is no longer able to have access to concessions to redistribute resources it becomes defunct essentially slowly but surely liberal democracy cannot sustain itself because it has not the material foundations as in the third world it has not the material foundations to actually appeal to the mass of the population liberal democracy lives on the competition between parties that have different strategies for redistribution but when there's nothing to redistribute for the mass of the population it loses its legitimacy and we get left or right populism now why do we get left or right populism because not only does liberal democracy have little to distribute but the working class itself is making concessions to capital it is not capital making concessions to labor labor is making concessions to capital it is becoming ever more precarious and under those circumstances it is not the industrial working class that is going to be an agent of transformation but much more likely those who experience commodification and the processes of exclusion that go along with it all right now I'm getting towards the end five minutes three you're very generous you know thank you all right now I'll just let me I will it's coming to an end fictitious commodities well labor money nature knowledge I'm adding knowledge commodification leads to precarity we heard a little bit about nurses and their precarious situation here in Georgia debt is corresponds to the commodification of money and we hear quite a lot about eviction um, Tamta's paper on Medea sorts also talks about where are you oh there you are Talks, talks about eviction, debt, nature. Well, I've heard from Nino about land, agricultural land that may be actually bought by foreign entrepreneurs. And we've heard about struggles around dams, which is to do, of course, with the control over water. So if we extend nature from land to air and to water, you can see how commodification leads to uh, many processes of dispossession and knowledge ah yes knowledge uh, this is one book that you might be interested in picking up not translating because it's very very thick there's a book by a woman by the name of Shoshana Zuboff it's called surveillance capitalism and it's all about the way social media and let's take Google or Facebook that they actually do not coercively extract knowledge from us, but they extract knowledge by virtue of our enthusiastic participation in Google or Facebook. And all the sort of waste knowledge turns out to be far from being wasteful, but is deployed, as you all know, um, for the advance of capitalism and that surveillance capitalism is what something we participate in it but what is going on is the commodification if you will of everyday life or also the commodification of knowledge which is extracted as we participate in social media but there is another concept that i have to bring to you and that's ex-commodification not in polanyi ex-commodification is the expulsion of people from commodification which also leads to social movements and struggles and destitution so we have unemployment um, that is also generated we might talk about refugees um, we might talk about how it's necessary for people to move to other countries to find employment unemployment exclusion people are increasingly excluded from the money economy 
um, pursuing subsistence existence. And nature, well, nature is, in a sense, dispossessed from people, but it's also destroyed. We are systematically destroying nature um, as we develop capitalism, deforestation, toxic waste, and other ways in which land is being destroyed. And knowledge, well, just think, the university. The university, increasingly, as you know perhaps better than even I, has become privatized. Yes, there is still a public university here, but there are multiple private universities that tend to focus on what? Business. Now, what is happening in two subjects like sociology? We'll not talk about economics. Philosophy. What is happening to languages? What is happening to the humanities, to history? They are becoming irrelevant in this marketized world. And so that's another way in which there is ex expulsion um, from, um, it's, 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 it's the tendency to produce, they become waste. Yes, beware. All right, finally, I've got to get to this point. Now, I'm just summarizing. So what I want to suggest to you that each of these forms of commodification and ex-commodification actually do harbour forms of movements, of resistance. And what I believe that we should be in the business of doing is elaborating what my friend Eric Olin Wright calls real utopias. The implicit in the movements that many of us in this room study, and there are movements, is a vision of a possible alternative. Now, labor precarity and unemployment has, won, has led to postulations of universal basic income. And we might even emphasize much more universal um, basic services. That we have to begin to think about using movements to develop some sort of basic income or access to services. This is a project that, of course, has had some, um, has, has had purchase power in Europe, but also in places like uh, India, uh, in places like Brazil, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and in Nam Namibia, it's a smaller country. That, that this idea, at least, is there. Then we can talk about money and debt, and uh, I think it was Costas who was talking about public banks the other day. So banks, of course, what, what it, why, when money is commodified, it's money making m more money. It's money being transferred, not being used to produce use values, but money to produce more money. That's what finance capital is. And the idea is, and of course, banks are heavily involved in this. The idea of public banks is a movement to actually contain that. Yes. And then dispossession around nature and destruction. There's a big movement in Brazil around MST, which is a movement for cooperatives to resist and partake um, in, in a, an alternative way of thinking about production. And finally, knowledge appropriation and instrumentalization of knowledge. Well, one can think of, as many people have, of the sort of digital commons that this but the digital world actually creates the possibility of what is called peer-to-peer -peer, um, production. The idea of actually collaborative production um, organized by the actual producers. And Wikipedia is Eric Wright's favorite example, uh, which he whacks very eloquently about. So, all right, finally, so what I want to suggest is that, that Polanyi gives us a vision of how we may engage the world of commodification. And I should say also that this is all very simplified. What is important about this picture, actually, is that we have to look at the relationships among the commodifications of these fictitious commodities. And they are very interlinked. And the advance of knowledge has, has made it possible for um, money to be develop all sorts of new ways of uh, of, develop, of, of advancing money, of, of generating debt, which in turn has laid the foundations for the expropriation of nature. These are interrelated. That will be the project 
there. Yeah. So my conclusion. Well, I think that Fanon offers us is a reconstructed map. He shows us how to actually map forms of domination and the alliances among social forces. He gives us an example how to do it, but it would look different in different countries. Second, Polanyi gives us a dynamic picture of social forces around the issues of commodification. And our role as critical social scientists and as activists is to tie social movements to real utopias, to visions, and to tie those visions to a totality. And so we have a role to play both as academics and as, you might say, following Fanon, sort of organic intellectuals, that they go hand in hand. And my experience talking to people here, this is just taken as a matter of course by many of you. And I'll end there, thank you. I can't leave your comment without comment, you know, about <coughs> a three or four, because for me it's best beloved critiques of modern social sciences, you see. I think that when we talk about, on first glance, in first approximation, they seem the same because we are talking about the plane, and it's already much better than talking about one line, which has one uh, teleological direction which we have to follow. But on the other side, when social scientists uh, drive these uh, planes which you talked about, uh, they model society as a plane earth uh, on a back of three elephants, and uh, this is a model which is uh, not exactly uh, uh, adequate to society. As soon as you go to this triangle, you have round earth, and you have a model in which something is somewhere, uh, you know, uh, uh, not driving, but, you know, it's around. In Poland, I have one question regarding this. You never mentioned that we live in post Bretton Woods world. And this is very important, I think, because when there was a golden standard, uh, knowledge and money were coupled to each other, you know? So knowledge did not appear as separate commodity, transcendentally involved in all commodification. Now knowledge became the separate commodity because it's decoupled. We are in post-liberal, post-modernist situation. To keep the situation uh, on the um, backs of the elephants, yes, we can leave this for. But if we want to make the stable social model out of this situation, we need to send one of these four again to infinity, to transcendental, you know? Maybe it's no more information, uh, knowledge, because knowledge is not information. Maybe it will be labor in this post-technological world in which no working places will remain, I don't know. But something will change in, because this is not stable to have four commodified, uh, you know, entities in social relations. Thank you. Did you want to go back? Uh, would you prefer to come back to the... Uh, 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 I'm going to go back to the... I'm going to go back to the... I'm going to go back to the... I'm going to იყო რომ ფანონის თეორიის განხილვის შემდეგ საქართველოს მაგალითი მოგვეცით და პოლანის შემდეგ ესე ცხადად არ მოგვეცით შეიძლება ჩვენ უკვე დაგარწმუნდეთ ჩვენს ინტერპრეტაციებში საქართველოსა და პოლანისზე მაგრამ ჩემთვის მაინც საინტერესო იქნებოდა თქვენი შეხედულება როგო რამდენად გვეხმარება პოლანი საქართველოს აღქმაში თქვენი გადმოსახედინა მეორე რაც მინდა და მე თქვა ამ გლობალურ სამხრეთსა და ჩრდილოეთზე რა არის ისეთ ერთი რამე არის მოცემულობა ჩემი აზრით ქართულ კონტექსტში და ძალიან ხშირად ზოგადად პოსტსაბჭოთა კონტექსტში რომ ჩვენ ნამდვილად ბევრად მეტად ვეცნობით მეინსტრიმულ დასავლურ თეორიებს ვიდრე პოსტკოლონიურ ან დეკოლონიურ თეორიებს შესაბამისად გუშინაც გაჟღერდა ეს მუდმივად და თქვენ ეს კარგად მოგეხსენებათ მუდმივად არის განცდა რომ საქართველოს ან ნებისმიერი სხვა პოსტსაბჭოთა ქვეყანა უნდა დავატოლოთ დავაზომოთ 
Ամջչամուրչենիլովիս � Մուդմիվատ դասավոլեց է դատոլեպիս կան, Մուդմիվատ դասավոլեց է չյանիթավիս շետարեմի սկան։ Շեսաբամիս էտ բոնդիշի դրոսրով մի կավեպ մագրամը կիտխայիքն է մոտ կեն ռոգոր խետավոտ Մագրամ հանայիրատ մովար գոտ ես չեղա դիլեմաս ռոմելից մեկ գիխար բոտ։ Մեծրով ոտնավրով գավարձով, ալբատ ես իսետի տրադիցիուլի շակի թխարիս, ձալի են մոգլ է դրոգոր ունդա գավում կլավդետ սակութար չամուր չեն Չամոր չեն նիլատ թավիս մուազր է բաս, խո։ Մարա, չամոր չեն նիլատ այս առամ ծխադի է, չամոր չեն նիլով արիս ամչոն թխոյս է, եկոնոմիկ ուրի կուտխիտ նազրավի դա, առա, միսա։ Կիտեղ խոբար արիս շե� Հայնդույս ալբատ նացնովի է ռուսետի սիտուածի իտա, մեզ արի սամոքալոքո սազուկատույապի սիսուստ է, անու, պոլիտիկ ուրի սիսուստ է, ատկոն ադամիան է բի թանամշորմը բեպեր ամվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվվ
Um, but that is not to say that there is, as actually Professor Menon said yesterday, that there is not some, uh, there are not spaces even in the North where there is a, a, a literature, a theory that might be of use um, uh, and might be adequate to different parts of the world. My belief is that Polanyi is useful and I try to show the ways in which I might think about it being useful. Um, in fact, I favor Polanyi over Fanon even though it looks like a very colonial situation in Georgia, it's certainly a very different colonial situation than the one that Fanon is talking about. Um, so I'm, I'm impressed that, that Polanyi, even though it was produced in the North, for the North, it's still, with modifications that I've suggested on the way, it still can be actually useful in the understanding of countries outside the north and I think that is because we live in actually a global capitalist system which as we've been learning in previous days is about financialization and I think we're living in a period of this third wave marketization it's not the first wave but it's a third wave and different from previous waves that is the project and Polanyi has got his finger on something extremely important and the commodification is important not only as a theoretical analytical tool but as an experiential phenomenon that is my claim that we do experience the world through commodification of these different commodi commo fictitious commodities um, so yeah that's my plea now I'm totally with you that, that, that there is this tendency to see anything outside the West as somehow non-West as, as deficient in some way or another that is a perspective that I don't think the Polanyan approach falls into. But however, I, might, I stand to be corrected. But yes, and, then we, and I think that Professor Menon yesterday said, yeah, we've got to get rid of Eurocentrism. But basically, we've got rid of it, and we, in, not in the North, and not by politicians necessarily, who are eager to identify Georgia with Europe. But nevertheless, amongst an audience like this, I assume that we got past Eurocentrism. And the question is, is are there what sort of are there any theoretical schemes that we can use that actually are sufficiently flexible but actually appeal to concrete situations in different places in the world? That's a long answer to your question, but I feel very strongly that I should say it in such detail. Yeah. Right. Ah, Russia. Yes, yes. You know, this is precisely the problem that I faced. There I was reading Polanyi in Siktivkar in 90. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. I mean, you know, and there the Russian economy, post-Soviet Russian economy is declining um, at the rate, of course, that the Chinese economy is expanding. Of course, the Chinese have learned the Polanyan lesson. You need to incubate a market economy within, in the case of China, a party state. Russia, the idea was destroy, destroy, destroy and uh, anything Soviet had to go. And of course, that was infused with a Western idea that the past was all bad. And if you destroy the past quickly enough, then the market will rise up. Well, it didn't happen. We all know that. And so what I observed was a very, and you might call organized chaos, sounds like a very good way of actually expressing it. Perhaps that explains why I couldn't really often get my handle on what was happening but the what was clear was the market you know one of my one of my friends said you know Michael Russia is not a free market it's a flea market so everybody is in participating in the market and of course as you were telling me today you know and uh, well, the wonderful story about the glory factory thank you very much for uh, presenting that. Um, but there, you know, the ways in which sort of uh, assets were just being destroyed, scrap metal. Yeah, th this, this, so the economy was being systematically destroyed. And one looked for the counter movement, but there was no counter movement, which is your point. There was no counter movement. And that's why I didn't, that's why I called it the great involution. There was no real systematic counter movement because there was no upgrowth of civil society. There was, and you've been talking about that too, there were of course networks of survival. And there were of course networks that linked the market economy to mafia organizations. 
Um, so there was definitely informal ties, but that does not count, in my view, as a counter movement. It was a weak, indeed, a fragmented um, post-Soviet civil society, the result of the collapse of that, that regime. So yes, so yeah, Polanyi seems to assume that if you push the market too far, society gets destroyed, then there's going to be spontaneously a counter movement. I mean, it's not, that, that's, a, that's a crude functionalist argument. In fact, in, in Russia, I would argue that there was not a counter movement, not the Polanyi sense. It's more like a comment rather than question, but yeah, both. Um, I want to make sure just uh, because there can be different interpretations of your talk today, keynote speech, which was very interesting. Uh, and but there is this question when you posed at the beginning, uh, northern or southern series, right? Uh, when it comes to Georgia, we never have this question. Like, when it comes to the theories from the North, it's not placed in the North. It's something universal, which we grow up with, and this is unquestionable thing. And at the universities, the only authors we read, and we are taught, and we teach, these are the theories from the North, which are never called beings from the north. So these are some universal theories. So the discussions we started uh, was aiming that they are, the world is diverse and the world is divided between also those who gain out of this global economy, political and economic order and those who suffer and those who are subordinated. So if we are also one of those who suffer from this capitalist order, but not only from capitalist order, but from powerlessness, powerlessness which comes from the periphery, from being in the country on the periphery. So in that case, we thought we need to consult other like country uh, theories which come also from the peripheries. So these are this is an attempt that aims to expand our low knowledge rather than, you know, to compound or to restrict it. So in this way, your lecture, uh, on the other hand, so one thing is that we don't have this option. But uh, what uh, I can take from your lecture is that um, you placed the universal theory as in one of the options. And you showed, you, you showed that the thing which seems to us as being universal, it is also an option. You know, it comes from the particular place and it is an option. So in that way, this is interesting. It was, if it was your intention, then yeah, I, I, I wanted to make sure that was it your intention to show that this is not something universal, but it comes also from a particular place as something from the Southern theory. And when it comes to the implications and translations, of course, we don't reject any theory because of its place, and we can take from any theory uh, which is useful from us, that I agree. And just one comment also about them. You mentioned about them uh, when you talked about Fanon, that he assumed that uh, Africa had some kind of bargaining power, right? And uh, here I think that in the 50s, Africa really had a bargaining power. It, first of all, bargaining power was the thing why African countries got independence. It was not the goodwill of colonialists to give them independence, but it was also that these countries had some kind of bargaining power to gain this independence. And the second thing is that 50s and 60s, are the years when global south or, or so-called like uh, at that time third world was like extraordinarily united. Like this president we don't have nowadays, like considering Bandung Conference of 1955, then 1961 in Cairo, then the non-alignment movement meets. And so they had this political and economic 
ties and they were f putting forward their agenda in UN and they formed with Raul Prebisch this different alternative. So they had, now we are powerless. We don't have any agenda to put forward from the periphery. But I think 50s were the years when the periphery showed its extraordinary political will and uh, uh, um, put forward economic alternatives. So these are some. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry for the long. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. Hello, uh. I'm going to ask the question in Georgia. I'm going to the question in Georgia. the Privat only shake it to me. My interest is to know how much data you have. Not concrete data. I'm competent in Ghana, Malawi. Don't you think you can buy some tips? I'm sure you can get some information. Some of the tips you can buy are very good. I'm sure you can get some information. I'm sure you can get some information. I'm sure you can get some Okay, yeah, well, that's two very interesting questions. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I will reiterate what you thought was what I was doing, and, I, and it's, a, it's in part an answer to your question, too. I am deliberate, I did not come here with the intention of talking about Fanon. Um, but the debate and discussion that took place seems to me important to think about, A, theories from the South, um, and to also show that many of these theories from the South are actually theories that have circulated through the North and then gone to the South. Um, but to, 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 to look at theories from the South and to think about colonialism in this context. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time in, 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 in Russia and that's a sort of an imperial, so I've, I've not spent much time in, in Georgia, so it, it, it strikes me obvious that one has to think about the colonial model. And the one I know best is Fanon. Um, so, and I'm saying yes, that we can even say that we can say that it really is a theory about Africa, but I believe um, that it can be made universal. It has, no, Edward Said wrote a, a wonderful essay called Traveling Theory. Theories travel around the world and they get reconstructed in different places. And if theories last, they travel and they get reconstructed. I think that has happened to Fanon, and I think it hasn't happened enough to Polanyi. I think we can do more with Polanyi um, in, in the non-Western countries. So yeah, I'm, so I am saying yes, there are the, 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 the sources of theory are particular, but that does not mean they cannot have some sort of universal applicability if they travel and are reconstructed. Right, are we on the same wavelength? Right, well, that, absolutely. That, my, absolutely, I agree with you. Therefore, I talked about Pranon. I mean, you could, I could see in the audience yesterday that nobody, well, nobody, very, there was no sort of resonance with the idea of Fanon with Professor Menon. So I thought, well, we better talk about Fanon because I thought he would be the most useful. So yes, no, I'm, I am not suggesting that you don't read from the South. Mind you, I think there is, and you'll see that there's all sorts of possibilities. So yes, I'm not, I, I, I deeply encourage you to, insofar as that means anything, uh, to, to, to be reading these theories from the South. Um, and I totally sympathize with this compulsion that is forced upon you for survival reasons to relate to the, these Northern theories, many of which are very increased, very parochial. Right, so yes, and your, your second point about, yes, yeah, you're right, you're right, Africa did, it definitely seemed to have bargaining power for all the reasons that you, you gave. Um, and the non-aligned countries were in fact a sort of an expression of that uh, bargaining power. 
I don't, I mean, I think you know, because colonialism had actually penetrated so deeply in Africa, that a post-colonial context was not in any way a threat to the North. So most, it was only where there were settler colonies was there real resistance to decolonization. So I am, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that in a country that I studied, that Zambia, that actually there was a lot of resistance. That basically, you know, multinational corporations knew that the post-colonial regime would depend upon the, 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 their, their investment in copper. Um, so, I, I, so, yeah. But, but generally, yes, there was a... But it was a different situation for two reasons, at least. One is that it was a different form of capitalism. I think we have to take that into account, that financial capitalism, third-wave marketization, when I was studying, you know, when these countries were becoming independent, had not begun. So I think that's a crucial variable. And the other variable is the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union was actually participating in struggles on behalf of the colonized. Like it or not, it's the reality. South African ANC was sponsored by, supported by ideologically, materially, and politically by the Soviet Union. Um, it didn't last into the post-Soviet period because, of course, the Soviet Union collapsed before, actually, the end of apartheid. And it's a very interesting situation. Some people argue it's because the Soviet Union collapsed that actually um, the Afrikaners were happy to give, um, give up apartheid, or so the, the capitalist class was. Anyway, so that, that, that yeah, so I, I, I sort of I've answered your question, perhaps not satisfactorily, because I don't know what exactly is behind it, but the reason, I mean, look, I mean, it seems ridiculous. I fly in here. I listened for two and a half days, and then I would talk about a paper that I wrote in Berkeley. That seemed ridiculous to me. Even if I make a fool of myself, it seems important, better to make a fool of myself than talk about a paper that is produced in the North, based on, you know, I have had some experience with other countries, but nothing, nothing like Georgia. So it seemed incumbent upon me to react to all the papers I was listening to. It seemed a matter of course. Um, otherwise, there's no... There's no chance of a conversation. I mean, there may not be a conversation even now, but I think that there probably is. I hope there is, but it, 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 it's, it's easier if, if you actually make an effort to, to move in the direction of the audience. See? So what would I have talked about? I mean, I wrote the paper, it's a pretty terrible paper, um, and it's actually, fascinatingly enough, it's a paper that is driven by a reconstruction, yet again, that's about a third or fourth time I've reconstructed Polanyi, to try and understand the modern conjuncture basically in, in, in the US and Europe and the, and the development of these populisms. And, you know, it strikes me there may be some relevance to that here, but I mean, I would, I would feel pretty silly talking about that. You're welcome to have a paper, but I mean, it's... I don't know if I'm answering your question.